I had been a secondary math teacher for five years, but in 1989, I was a stay-at-home mom with four very busy children. Amy was 13, Jacob 11, <clears throat> Trevor 10, and Carmen was eight years old. Our kids were very happily engaged in after-school programs, brownies, gymnastics, dance, basketball, football, hockey, <laughs> soccer, sleepovers, and fun. I went on every school field trip, and I was president of Jacob School PTA. On October 22nd, 1989, my husband Jerry and I were <clears throat> invited to dinner at a friend's house when our neighbor called to tell us to come home. He told us that our 11-year-old son Jacob had been kidnapped by a masked gunman one half mile from our house. He had to hang up. He was calling the police. Just like that, my life would never be the same. My world had always been about children, but seeing the, the sadness and fear in our own kids' eyes was more than my spirit could handle. I just so badly wanted to take it all away, but I couldn't. After a few days of investigation, defeated and sleep deprived, I crawled into bed and I decided I'm never gonna get out of this bed. It hurts too much, it's too hard, I can't do this anymore. And I suddenly saw uh, Jacob curled up in a ball saying the same things. I can't do this anymore, it's too hard, they're never going to find me. And I sat up and screamed, Hold on, Jacob. We will find you, but you have to stay strong. And at that point, I got out of bed. It felt like some, I envisioned our house on, on stilts. And it was like somebody had knocked the stilts right out from under us. We had to figure out how to navigate our way through this new world. I learned that the motive behind kidnapping was for sexual purposes. Who would do that? I just couldn't understand. I knew that I had to make a decision, and after seeing Jacob curled up in a ball, I knew I had to get out of bed. That was the first of many decisions I made early on and throughout the next 34 years of searching. I knew I couldn't live in the darkness, so I sought light wherever I could, and I vowed that while I was searching for Jacob, I would continue to work to build a world that values children and cares for them and protects them. <clears throat> I started picking up some of the mail. We had stacks of mail that we had received, and I began to read some of the letters. Dear Mrs. Wetterling, when I was four, I was molested by my babysitter. Dear Patty, my cousin was abducted by her mom and molested by mom's boyfriend. Dear Jacob, we all want you to know we are searching for you and not to, that we're rooting for you. When I was eight, I was molested by my older brother. I know how that feels. Dear Mrs. Wetterling, I send my sympathy and advice. Never stop searching for Jacob. Don't give up hope, because if my parents quit looking for me, I wouldn't want to come home. I felt like we had, we had touched on a, a river of victims that we didn't know existed. Everything inside of me said, you have to do something to stop this so kids can grow up and follow their dreams. I learned so much along the way about personal safety that I had to share with kids and parents alike. Like, tell your kids, you are special. Nobody has the right to hurt you physically or touch you in ways that make you feel yucky. If they do, it's not your fault. Tell a trusted adult. 
I wanted kids to feel safe in their own world and to know that there are way more good people in the world than bad. <clears throat> there were more letters. Dear Mrs. Wetterling, thank you for coming and talking to our school. It took a lot of courage. You're really the only person we were quiet for. <laughs> <laughs> Kids wrote, drew hearts and rainbows, and they wrote heartfelt things like, I'm looking too. Stay strong for Jacob. Keep your hopes high. My favorite letter was from Dalton, who was in second grade, and he wrote in crooked letters on that lovely second grade paper with a line in the middle. And he wrote words spelled the way that they sound. Jacob will be fine. If he's not all right, you'll see him in heaven. My dog died. If Jacob's gone, he can play with my dog. Now, that was an image I could live with Jacob playing with his dog. Kids' letters gave me hope. Every morning I got up seeking reasons to believe, and the letters were strengthening. But the hope is real. Along the way, I met kids who were abducted and came home after six months, five years, 10 years, 17 and a half years. And I figured if these kids could pick themselves up and redefine themselves, surely I can do this. Our family sang songs of hope. We held hands, we lit candles, and we were always surrounded by people helping in big ways and small and lifting us up on the days when we couldn't do it ourselves. I also started talking to communities about teaching kids about respect and respectful, respectful relationships. We have to stop growing those who would cause harm. We have to stop this from happening. Talk to your kids about respecting one another. We owe it to them. And these are easy traits to learn, especially when we start early. My world was rocked again when, in 2016, the man who took Jacob admitted to kidnapping and murdering him, and he showed the investigators where Jacob's remains were. It felt like he was taken from us all over again. I'd been a hope-filled, searching mom for nearly 27 years. Now who was I? Who am I? <clears throat> Once again, I had to make a decision. I knew that the world that Jacob knew and loved and believed in was worth fighting for. This time, I drew strength from my kids and my grandkids. I loved to savor the perspective and wisdom and clarity of my grandchildren. Last December, Jerry and I took our youngest grandson, Finn, he's eight, he was eight, shopping for Christmas presents for his, his parents. He knew what his mom wanted, but his dad was tricky. He had no idea. So we got to the store, and we got a shopping cart and started walking down the roads, and he put something in the cart. So I said, Finn, is, is that what you'd like to give your dad? He looked at me, and he said, it's a possibility. <laughs> <laughs> We walked down every row in the store <laughs> as he filled this cart with possibilities. <laughs> Eventually, he chose one to be the gift to give to his, his dad. But I was so renewed and smiling as we're walking this store, through the store, with a cart full of possibilities. <laughs> I used to teach children how to solve problems and find answers. Now, children are my teachers. And I promise, wherever I go, for as many days as I have left on this planet, I promise to fill my cart with possibilities. I hope you'll join me.
Thank you. <laughs>